I'm sorry about that, Adam. Uh, I don't have any slides tonight. You can black that. I don't know. Got it. Um, and since I didn't need to set up the screen for myself, I didn't set it up for you. So sorry for the trouble when you couldn't see that, but uh, I didn't think of it. If you want to open up your Bibles to Exodus 14, that's going to be the place where we're going to start tonight. And um, I would uh, encourage you tonight to get your Bibles out. We're going to mostly do reading tonight. There's a lot of turning and reading um, some different passages. I said before that I was going to do this lesson last Sunday night, but the, the, the lesson from last Sunday needed two lessons, and so this got pushed back. And I'll remind you, for those of you anyway who were in the Wednesday night class in Joshua where this is coming from, when... When um, we were studying through Joshua chapter 11, um, I think that the slide that I was looking at at the time in Joshua 11 was something like how um, Joshua and Israel were overcoming impossible odds. Uh, and that was the whole theme, was to overcome these impossible odds. And there were, I think in Joshua 11 and like verses 1 through 4, I think there were at least three things that we said right there at the very top. Uh, we talked about the city of Hazor and how Hazor was um, 200 acres worth of city and 40,000 people compared to the city of Jericho, which is like five or six acres. And so if you thought Jericho was a chore, five or six acres were taking over a city 200 acres, Ben did some research for me, and he said it's close to like the size of six flags for, if you want to imagine uh, how much territory that would be that Joshua was, was trying to overcome. And so uh, not only was Hazor uh, a big city and a strong city, but there was a big coalition of forces. There were a lot of different cities who came together to fight against the people. And then number three, this is our lesson for tonight. It said that the people, the coalition of forces, had chariots that they were using to fight against Israel. Um, and so the title of the lesson tonight is Horses and Chariots. And the last thing that we talked about at the very end of chapter 11 was that Joshua and Israel fought against and defeated the Anakim. And those are the descendants of Anak, the giants in the land. And you'll remember that it was the giants in the land from Numbers 13 that caused the spies originally to say, we're not able to go in and fight the land because the people there are giants. Well, in uh, Joshua chapter 11, they did fight against those people and they defeated them. And so the idea is impossible odds. That's what brought us to this study. Um, I knew that the theme, the picture of horses and chariots in the Bible was worth pursuing. I didn't know how worth pursuing it was until I put these notes together. And so if you want to focus tonight on flipping through the Bible and reading, um, that's great. I am more than happy. I can just email you my notes and all the verses that we, that we um, read tonight if you don't want to focus on trying to write them all down. Let's start in Exodus chapter 14, though. And the reason why we're going to start in Exodus 14 is because this big theme so far as I can tell of horses and chariots in the Bible all starts with the Exodus. It all, when you hear the word horses and chariots, it, it ought to always push our brains back to what God did in the story of Israel and the Egyptians. And so we'll just read this one. It's a little bit longer, but Exodus 14, and let's start in verse 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, What is this that we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. 
the Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them and camped at the sea. And so um, I would just have you, before we keep on reading this, I would just have you to imagine that coming up out of Egypt is Israel, this group of people who for 400 years has been slaves. They have nothing. They're slaves. They're poor and they're weak and they're on foot and they have no military training and they don't even, they barely have any food at all. They just have the stuff that they're carrying with them. And it's not like it's um, only the men, it's the women and the children and everything that they own, they're, they're carrying it. And so we look behind us and we see this army coming, but not just an army of armed soldiers, but iron chariots being pulled by horses with armed warriors inside of the wheels. This is a bad situation. I mean, I don't know if those words do it justice. This is an impossible situation. Look at verses 16 and 18. Lift up your staff. This is what God says to Moses. Stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his horse, uh, his host, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. There is like when you're reading the Bible and you keep seeing chariots and horsemen, chariots and horsemen, chariots and horsemen. You're supposed to think, OK, the chariots and the horsemen. It's a really big deal. Jump down to chapter 14 and verse 23. We'll read verses 23 through 29. Um, the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen. And in the morning, watch the Lord. Uh, in the morning, watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and the clouds looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into panic clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained, but the people of Israel walked on dry, dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on the right hand and their left. Um, go over to chapter 15. Chapter 15 is the song of Moses. And the song of Moses is once Israel realized probably for the very first time that they were free and that they no longer had to be afraid of the army that was chasing them. They sang this song and the song starts and the main theme of the song is all about how God defeated the horses and the chariots. Um, this impossible, hopeless situation. Verses 1 through 4. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my salvation, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. In verse 19, uh, the song is over. You can see, if, you, if, you're, if your Bible lays it out in a poetic way, the song ends in verse 18, and then verse 19 is a description of the song, or a summary, and verse 19 says, For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. Just explaining what happened. But Israel walked on dry ground. And so we're going to base everything that we're going to talk about tonight and all of our references to horses and chariots upon the fact that God saw the horses and the chariots of the most powerful army uh, of this day 
and said, no problem. This is not a thing for me. I don't care if there's thousands of horses and chariots. No problem. It's not a factor. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, I'm just going to look at verse 1 because this is where um, Moses is saying what the children of Israel are going to do. And then we'll look down at verses 17 and 18. That's where you see what God says. Verse 1, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you and he names the seven nations. Jump down to verse 17. When you're getting ready to go in and take this land that God is going to give you. Verse 17. If you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them. But you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. Our hope for the future and everything inside of us that that God tells us, don't be afraid of what's coming, is based upon what God did in the past. You don't need to be afraid of these giant monsters or the 200-acre city of Hazor or the coalition of forces or the, even the chariots that they have because God took care of the Egyptians. He's going to take care of this problem for you also. Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 11. In Deuteronomy 11, this is one worth remembering in this lesson. Um, this passage in Deuteronomy 11 is not about don't be afraid of what you're facing because God has defeated horses and chariots. This passage says, hey, you know that God has defeated horses and chariots. You had better obey him. Um, in verses 1 through 4, you shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. And consider today, since I am not speaking to your children who have not known or seen it, consider the discipline of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his outstretched arm, his signs and his deeds that he did in Egypt to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to all his land, and what he did to the army of Egypt and their horses and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them as they pursued after you and how the Lord has destroyed them even to this day. In verses 7 and 8, your eyes have seen all the great work of the Lord that he did. You shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and take possession of the land uh, that you're going over to possess. And so it's not just about remember what God did and don't be afraid of what stands in your way. It's also remember what God did and make sure that you obey him. Uh, you don't want to be the horse and the chariot that God is going to overcome. You want to be the one on his side. Look at Deuteronomy 20 and verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 1, when you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Um, so don't be afraid. I'm not going to read all of the passages um, in Joshua. There's a couple of them there. I will just point you real quick. I'm at um, Joshua chapter 11. And starting in verse 4, I guess look at verse 1. There's something neat. In chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, When Jabin king of Hazor heard this, in verse 4, they came out with their troops, a great horde and a number like the sand that is on the seashore, with very many horses and chariots. And all these kings joined their forces and came and encamped together. And what God told Joshua to do is um, to burn the chariots and to hamstring the horses. They're not going to have horses and chariots to fight against. 
God's people. That was the story of Jabin, king of Hazor. You will remember this one, I think. Turn over to Judges 4. In Judges chapter 4, <coughs> excuse me, let's do verses 1 through 7. Nah, we probably won't read verses 1 through 7. Start in verse 1. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died, and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth Hagayim. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly. And so Deborah, this is the story of Deborah, where she calls out Barak and she says, get your army together, you're going to go fight against Jabin, king of Hazor. Now this is several years down the road, and I don't know what the explanation of this is. Is Jabin the name of the king who reigns in the city of Hazor, and this is just another one? Or is Jabin one of the Joshua 11 Jabin of Hazor, is he one of his descendants who escaped and now one of his descendants is Jabin king of Hazor? At any rate, you've got another Jabin king of Hazor oppressing the people of Israel. And the same thing is a problem here in Judges 4 that was a problem in Joshua 11. This is an impossible force to overcome. Uh, and it specifically says... Their strength is in their 900 chariots of iron. Look at verses 12 through 16. In chapter 12, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 12. When Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him, from Harasheth Hagayim to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor, 10,000 men following him, and the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. You thought you were so bad because you had 900 chariots, but here you come to fight against the Lord, not the Lord's people, against the Lord, and you and all your studly 900 chariots end up with the leader of all of them running away on foot. Your chariots don't matter to God. That's the, the theme. That's the story all throughout the Bible. You can make yourself as big and as powerful and as awesome and scary as you want, but it doesn't matter to God. And God's people are commissioned based upon what God has accomplished in the past to face these scary and impossible odds and to say, ah, oh, there's 900 chariots in my path. God can take care of it. I'm not afraid. There are three things. I'll call them three failures in the Bible um, that I want to look at. We'll look at three failures. And then uh, one last thing at the end of those three failures, and then we'll be finished for tonight. The first failure is Saul. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 10. I wonder if there's going to be a new take on this passage. I, I, I have always said one thing about this passage, and now that I'm reading it through the lens of this lesson... With the horses and the chariots, I'm wondering if there's something else that I need to do with this. In 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 8, this will sound familiar to you. Samuel tells Saul, Go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I am coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. Saul, go to Gilgal, wait for me for seven days... And on that seventh day, I'm going to come and I'm going to offer sacrifices. And you should know how this story goes in chapter 13. And verses 5 and 6. 
the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel, listen to this, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand of the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped at Michmash to the east of beth Aven. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and tombs and cisterns. In verses 8 and 9, Saul waited for seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offerings here to me and the peace offering. And the, he offered the burnt offering. And as soon as he did, Samuel showed up and he said, what have you done? First of all, you're not a Levite. You should not be offering sacrifices to God. Second of all, I told you to wait for me. I'm coming and I'm going to do it. And so God takes away the kingdom from Saul. You can read about that in verse 14. Now here's what I've done in the past, and, and, and I think this is still some of the point here. Um, Saul's flaw, I've said in the past, was his disobedience. Samuel said, wait for me seven days, don't offer the sacrifice, and he disobeyed God. And offered a sacrifice when he should not have offered the sacrifice. And I say, this is, this is his mistake. But when you look at the bigger context here and how it was the army of chariots and horsemen and troops that were causing Israel to get scared and to lose their mind. And Saul saw that everybody was getting scared and scattering and losing their mind. He panicked. And instead of doing what the entire story up to the Bible has pointed us to, when you see the chariots and the horsemen and the enemies of God's people, don't be afraid of them. Don't panic and don't lose your mind. Everybody panicked and lost their mind, which caused Saul to do things that he should not have done. The problem is not his disobedience. The problem is his lack of faith that led to the disobedience. It was his lack of trust that God was able and going to handle this situation. After all, there were tens of thousands of chariots involved in this situation. But if Saul had been paying attention to the passages that we read up to this point, he would have heard that God said, Don't you know that I took care of that before? The chariots are not something that's trouble for God. That's number one. It was a lack of faith and a lack of trust that led Saul to fall. Number two is Solomon. Turn over to Deuteronomy 17. In Deuteronomy 17, um, really this context starts back in verse uh, 8, I think. I'm not going to read all the way back up in verse 8. Let's see. Let's just start in verse 14. So this is the law of Moses command for when Israel eventually gets a king. I would leave my finger here. If you, if you haven't done this already, I would leave my finger here in this passage and I would make a cross reference. You'll see it in just a second. Starting in verse 14. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose, one from among your brothers. You shall set his king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother, only he must not. Listen, this is... This is what the king eventually can't do. He can't be a foreigner. He can't acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order 
to acquire many horses since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. It didn't work out for Egypt anyway. Why would you go and try and do what Egypt did when it didn't work for Egypt in the first place? Don't do that. In verse 17, he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. So keep your finger there and turn over in your Bible to 1 Kings 10. This is a description of Solomon. And the reason why I'm saying you should cross-reference these two things is because in the description of Solomon's behavior, he did every single thing that God said not to do. God said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And 1 Kings 10 says, Solomon did this, Solomon did this, Solomon did this. He did every single thing that God said don't do. Um, this starts back in 14. We won't read from all the way in 14. We'll start in verse 26. Um, Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. And the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stone. And he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore and the shephelah. And Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt and Ku. And the king's traders received them from Ku at a price. A chariot could be imported from Egypt for 600, 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And so through the king's trade, they were exported to all the kings of the Hittites and Syria. The, 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 the language here is pointing us to Solomon had lots of chariots and lots of horses. And what we're supposed to think about with this is, wow, isn't Solomon strong? Who's going to overcome an army with all of these chariots and with all of these horses and with all of these troops? He didn't learn. In chapter 11, as you move on, he loved many foreign women and it was all of these women who led his heart astray and ultimately led to his demise. Do you remember Deuteronomy chapter 11? Remember what God did to the horses and chariots in Egypt. And when you remember that, you better be faithful because of it and obey him. Solomon didn't do that. It's not that he was afraid of the horses and the chariots in the land and that he lacked faith and trust in God to overcome his enemies. It's that he put his faith and his trust in these forces instead of putting his faith and his trust in God. One last thing that we'll look at, and that's a failure that we see in Isaiah. Turn over to Isaiah 2. Isaiah chapter 2, starting in verse 6. Israel has fallen far by the time that Isaiah writes. And starting in verse 6 is what God is going to do to the people because they have fallen away from the Lord. Starting in verse 6, I'm going to read down to verse 9. For you have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of things from the east, fortune tellers like the Philistines. They strike hands with the children of foreigners. Their land is filled with silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. Their land is filled with horses. There is no end to their chariots. Their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hand. So what uh, to what uh, their own fingers have made in verse 9. So man is humbled and each one is brought low. Do not forgive them. They thought that they had everything. And they thought that because of their horses and chariots, they had no need to fear anyone. But God, through Isaiah, is saying to this group of people, you've got tons of money, you've got tons of power with your horses and chariots, but what you don't have is the Lord, and because of that, you are about to be humbled. Don't think for one second that all your horses and chariots are going to protect you. Look at Isaiah 22. Isaiah 22 and verses 5 through 10.
For the Lord God of hosts has a day of tumult and trampling and confusion in the Valley of Vision. The Valley of Vision is Jerusalem here. This is, this is what's coming. The enemies of God's people are coming. They're going to batter down walls. They're going to shout to the mountains. Elam, that's God's enemies. They bore the quiver. They have chariots and horsemen. And Kerr uncovered the shield. Your choicest valleys were full of chariots. And the horsemen took their stand at the gates. He has taken away the covering of Judah. Judah put their, their hope and their uh, salvation in their horses and chariots. And now the enemies are coming at them with horses and chariots. The second part of verse 8. In that day, you looked to the weapons of the house of the forest. You sought out to defend yourself against these forces with your own weapons. And not only that, in verse 9, you saw that the breaches of the city of David were many. You collected the waters of the lower pool. And you counted the houses in Jerusalem. And you broke down the houses to fortify the wall. You said, uh-oh, the enemies are coming. We better dig a hole so that we can store lots of water for when we need it. And we better break our houses down so that we can fortify the gates against our enemy. Uh-oh, they're coming. It's bad. In verse 11, you made a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the pool. Listen, this is their problem. But you did not look to him who did it or see him who planned it long ago. Stop thinking that you're going to protect yourself with all of these horses and chariots against the horses and chariots of the enemy. What you, Israel, need more than anything else right now is to go to God and say, God, we know that you're able. Protect us and save us. Look at verses 15 through 18. This is God speaking to, to the ruler um, of Judah. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Come now, go to the steward to Shebna, who is over the household, and say to him, What have you to do here? And whom have you here that you have cut out a tomb for yourself? You who cut out a tomb on the height and carve a dwelling for yourself in the rock. You're cutting out this giant cistern to store water so that you have plenty of water when your enemies come. Isaiah says, that's a really neat grave that you just dug for yourself. Now there's going to be a place to throw your dead body. Verse 17, Behold, the Lord will hurl you away violently, O oh, you strong man. He will seize firm, hold on you, and whirl you around and around and throw you like a ball into the wide land. There you shall die, and there shall be your glorious chariots, you shame of your master's house. Our salvation is not in our might. It's not in our brains and what we come up with and all of the things that we can fight against the enemies of God and the enemies of God's people. Our salvation only ever has been in God himself. Look at chapter 31. Isaiah chapter 31 and verse 1. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. Our job is to trust God. That's the point of this lesson. That's why we've looked at all these horses and chariots. Our, our job is to trust God. We don't fear chariots because they're nothing to God. And we don't put our hope in chariots because they're nothing to God. If you want to highlight this in your Bible or underline this in your Bible or remember it, memorize it, whatever you need to do. Psalm 20 and verse 7. Some people trust in chariots. Some people trust in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. That's our motto. That should be our motto. As a body of God's people. One last thing. I told you there were three bad examples. There was Saul, there was Solomon, there's Israel, and how they all were afraid of the foreign chariots and put their hope in their own chariots and in their might. Turn over to Isaiah 66. We're winding this down. I'm almost done. 
Isaiah chapter 66. This is the end of Isaiah for, uh, as you read through the Bible and you, you want to just do a word search for chariots in the Bible, um, one of the things that you're going to find is that the final judgment day is often portrayed as God coming to war against his enemies. And guess what he comes in? His chariot. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger in fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire the Lord will enter into judgment, and by his sword all the flesh, and those slain by the sword will be many. One last passage, Revelation 18. Revelation 18 is a description of the mighty city Babylon. Babylon in Revelation 18 is not really describing, it's not describing Babylon, it's not describing Rome. It's describing the kingdoms and the power and all of the accomplishments of mankind, humanity. And look at what's ultimately going to happen to all of the wonderful accomplishments of mankind and humanity. The second part of verse 10. Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon. For in a single hour your judgment has come. Listen to this, verse 11. The merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo, this is what Babylon was made of. Gold and silver and jewels and pearls and fine linen and purple cloth and silk and scarlet cloth. All kinds of scented wood. All kinds of articles of ivory. All kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses, and chariots, and slaves, that is, human souls. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone out from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. Verse 16, alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. Your hope and salvation had better not be in things of this life. Our hope and our salvation and that which we trust in and serve is not school and education. I say to the young kids down here, I tell my kids I have high expectations for my kids. I expect you to work hard and I expect you to get good grades. That is not going to be where you find your salvation though. You're not going to find your salvation in your career. No matter how high up the ladder you're able to climb. You're not going to find your salvation in money, no matter how much of it you ever possess. Our salvation is not going to come from government and what government figures out. It's certainly not going to come from a vaccine. That's not our salvation. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. That's the end of this lesson. You can close your notebook. I'm going to do something a little bit different now.